Hello friends, welcome to the EduSight Network. Our today's topic of discussion is Women Writers of America and today's lecture is part of our ongoing series on American literature that we have been having for the past few months and for this discussion we have with us in our studio our subject expert Dr. Bheem Singh Thayya and uh, he has taught English literature for over four decades at different universities in India and abroad. He has to his credit several books on Anglo-American literature and higher education including The Hero in Hemingway, another book is uh, Poet Critics on Shakespeare, then The University Autonomy in India and A New History of English Literature to name a few books and he is also the chief editor of the Journal of Drama Studies, an international journal of research in world drama in English including translation. So with this let us welcome sir and request him to begin our today's lecture. Thank you for coming sir. Thank you. Well I thought of uh, having a separate lecture on women writers of America because uh, if you go through the histories of American literature, you find two very clear biases. One is, you see, the repressed sections, including women, blacks, other minorities. The other bias is against anything radical because they would like to preserve their conservatism to the maximum extent. The most widely read history of American literature is the cycle of American literature by Robert Spiller and uh, here there are 12 chapters and 27 writers are mentioned in the contents. Out of these 27, there is only one woman writer that is Emily Dickinson and there is no black writer mentioned at all. So that is the space given to the minorities and the ignored sections, uh, what we call margins these days. So women, blacks, other minorities, they are on the margins. That's why I thought we should separately focus on at least the important women writers America has had. The very first we need to remember was Harriet Beecher Stowe, S-T-O-W-E. Well, she uh, was in the mid-19th century and uh, wrote that famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which came out in 1852. Now, around the same time, Hawthorne, Melville, uh, they were writing, who are very prominently mentioned in every writing on American literature. Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, so on and so forth. So uh, this male dominance on the literary uh, history of America has ignored writers like uh, uh, Stowe. Although Stowe, uh, to my mind, is a much more important writer than Hawthorne or Melville. Uh, you see, uh, 1865, you would remember, was the year of the American Civil War when Abraham Lincoln was the president of America who himself was murdered during the war. But he won the war. The war was to end slavery of the Negroes, of the blacks. Uh, who were brutally, mercilessly treated worse than animals by the white Americans. 
and it went on for 150 years, if not more. Uh, it was to abolish uh, the slavery that North rose against it. But South, Southern states being more conservative, and that's where slavery was more widely practiced because they were needed on the agricultural farms, the blacks. So North and South pitted against each other. <clears throat> well, Abraham Lincoln himself made a remark about Stowe. When she met him, he said, oh, you are the little woman who made that book that made the great war. That was his statement. He was so highly impressed. And it really was the one uh, uh, most uh, important factor which brought about the abolitionist movement. Uh, it is uh, a miracle to think of the number of copies that were sold. 300,000 copies in one year. That is official. Uh, and think of mid-19th century, when printing press was just manual. And many more copies, more than 3 lakh, were sold in pirated editions and, uh, you see, unauthorized editions. So it was so widely read because everybody wanted to go through it and it acted as a source of inspiration. Not only that, <coughs> sorry, it was also converted into a drama, again unauthorized. And from New York to Francisco, everywhere in the cities, it was being staged and people were crazy and uh, they will feel not only inspired but excited, ready to participate in any war to abolish slavery. So uh, such important writers uh, better not uh, be ignored. I am glad uh, here in DU I think they have now prescribed in one of the courses. Right. Uh, which is heartening. So that is one writer I would uh, recommend and uh, uh, I have great, you say, uh, respect as uh, a literary document for my Uncle Tom's, sorry, Uncle Tom's cabin. Uh, even now it is most widely printed uh, novel from America. But official histories of American literature would still continue to ignore, you see, such writers. And they are, you see, hung up uh, with the um, so-called big names of the male writers, Hawthorne and Melville always from that period. Anyway, uh, in the 19th century, again, uh, a contemporary of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, was Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson was a poet and the only one who is mentioned here. Uh, she is also called the recluse of Amherst, A-M-H-E-R-S-T. Amherst is one of the New England towns and she belonged there. She is called a recluse because she very little participated in uh, external or social life and lived with herself. And the poetry she wrote is entirely her personal and private life. That is the subject of her poetry. And the reason, of course, the historians would uh, pick her up because she is not talking of any politics, she is not talking of any social reforms. So safest writer to talk about. <laughs> and they would play her up as the greatest poet. Uh, uh, she does have an intensity in her poetry, I have taught her. Uh, um, but as I said, it is focused on her private personal life. She didn't marry, lived alone. So uh, the poetry is more about life denied rather than life lived. 
so repressed life and more so by the Puritan restrictions. 19th century America was still dominated by Puritanism and Puritanism was worse than Victorianism. Uh, so many restrictions, particularly on women, uh, you would not do this, do that, and so on. So no public life for them. And she, therefore, foots the bill. She is an ideal woman writer for them. That's why she alone gets a mention here. As for the uh, quality of her poetry, uh, you see, uh, she was closer to, I would say, John Donne. Uh, she has the same metaphysical quality in her poetry, uh, which combines the material and the spiritual, the physical and the mental. Uh, so these uh, contraries are combined uh, in her poetry, and that brings about intensity and curiosity. And one good thing, of course, about her was that although uh, a product of the American Renaissance, which means American Romanticism or Transcendentalism, the movement which was headed by Emerson and Thoreau, so a late product, the later phase of that, uh, which is mid-19th uh, century, because uh, Emerson and Thoreau uh, were more dominant in 30s and 40s whereas Stowe and Dickinson, they come after 50s. So 50s and 60s, uh, right in the middle of the Civil War, 1865. So that is their period. So her poetry, uh, for that matter, uh, has something new to offer, which was not there in the earlier uh, American poets because she is closer to Dunn, and she departs from these transcendentalists also because uh, they were dogmatic in their faith in uh, nature, God, and so on, and they did not discard Puritanism altogether. So they were a combination of uh, the Romantics and uh, the Puritans, whereas uh, she was more of a skeptic. Uh, Emily Dickinson, I would say, was more of a skeptic than a believer in Puritanism because in her poetry she uh, puts a question mark to all those Puritan practices and uh, in a very subtle uh, way. So that aspect of her poetry one need to uh, understand and appreciate, which normally is not done. Anyway, uh, these two uh, writers, women writers, one uh, novelist and one poet of the 19th century are important to remember. Now, after that, uh, in the closing years, 1890s, in fact, uh, uh, mid-80s, and then the first decade of the 20th century, there come two uh, uh, more uh, important uh, women writers. One was Edith Wharton, and uh, uh, the other was Willa Cather. So I would call them pre-modernists, because modernism comes in 1920s after World War I. Uh, these two writers, although they continued writing after World War I also, but they carry the stamp of the pre-war uh, psyche and pre-war uh, culture uh, of America and the issues uh, which were prominent before the war. After the war, uh, you see, you have the lost generation and all. So every writer uh, has uh, the stamp uh, or location, cultural location, of um, uh, her or his youth, like Hemingway, although continued writing until 1961, but he continued to be a writer of lost generation, 1920s. Similarly, 
uh, Edith Wharton and Willa Cather. Uh, see, they continued to be pre-modern uh, writers uh, who uh, did not really belong to the lost generation, although their novels came right up to 40s, uh, 1940s. Uh, Edith Wharton is n best known by uh, two of her novels. Uh, oh, oh, one is um, um, the, the, the Age of Innocence, The Age of Innocence, and um, the, the, the other is The House of Mirth. House of Mirth. Now, uh, the best comparison one can make of Edith Wharton is with Henry James, because both are contemporaries, and uh, both uh, share uh, their passion for uh, making fiction an art form. Because before Henry James, a uh, novel was not self-conscious in America. Uh, not self-consciously artistic, uh, just storytelling. But uh, these writers tried to make it art uh, comparable to poetry, and therefore uh, fiction uh, came of age. Uh, when like Brooks, by the way, one of the thinkers of the time, he wrote a book called uh, um, America's coming of age, uh, that is important. And rightly it had come of age. And Henry James uh, not only influenced American fiction, he influenced uh, the entire uh, uh, fiction in English. In fact, uh, the historians of English literature also included uh, in that history, history of England. Uh, whereas uh, he was in America, uh, an American, but later, of course, he lived there for many years, settled in London, because he thought America was still culturally backward, and therefore, uh, civilizationally, uh, we uh, the Americans had much to learn from Europe, so he went back to the roots, and that's why in Henry James's novel, you remember. There is always a uh, comparison and contrast between the past and the present of America, between the European roots and the new settlement uh, on the new continent. So uh, that's why even the title, for example, one of the novels is The American. Uh, even in the portrait of a lady, you know, uh, Isabel Archer, she recalls her past in England. Um, the home, so on and so forth. So Edith Wharton is a similar kind of uh, novelist who uh, she compares with Henry James, uh, both in searching analysis of American culture as well as trying to make a uh, novel uh, an art form. And after Edith Wharton comes Willa Cather. Uh, Willa Cather was more writing even after the war, but then uh, she does not carry the, uh, you say, uh, uh, the lost generation uh, psyche and those internal problems which Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, and others would write about. Uh, uh, Willa Cather is best known for uh, My Antonia, which is about World War I, actually. My Antonia, uh, she participates in the war and loses his life, sorry. And similarly, another novel she is known for is A Lost Lady, uh, where she raises the feminine issue, how uh, women are repressed both by religion as well as uh, politics. Uh, they, they have no share, no room of their own, as Virginia Woolf would say. So A Lost Lady is another novel by Willa Cather. And another important, she wrote so many, 
Another, I would say, is a death come for the archbishop. Uh, that, that too is an important novel. Uh, these three, you see, uh, novel she is best known by. And um, as I said, although she keeps writing, but she is not an experimentalist like the modernists were. That is the main difference between the modernists and the pre-modernists. Pre-modernists are heading towards modernism, uh, particularly in trying to make fiction an art form. But at the same time, they are not really experimenting with uh, uh, new and newer techniques, which uh, the post-war writers would do. Hemingway would do, Fitzgerald would do, Faulkner would do. So uh, th that, that difference is there. So, but then they are important in their own right. Uh, both, uh, you see, in terms of gender as well as in terms of the development of the American novel from mere storytelling to mm, an art form. Now, uh, then comes the modernist phase uh, post-World War I, particularly 1920s, which in American literature is called the Second Renaissance. The first renaissance was in 1830s, uh, headed by Emerson and Thoreau. The second renaissance uh, is 1920s. Uh, here, uh, it, it was dominated by Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, you know, in poetry. So hardly any woman uh, writer gets a space. And in fiction, you had uh, Hemingway, Faulkner, and then Fitzgerald, uh, these three, uh, again dominating uh, uh, the scene. But there were women writers uh, of great importance, I would say. And uh, one of them, who was not uh, a poet nor a novelist, but an editor of an important journal called Poetry. Uh, her name was Harriet Munro. You see, Harriet Monroe, M-O-N-R-O-E. Uh, Harriet Monroe edited this poetry journal from 1912 to 1962, full 50 years. And she was largely responsible for promoting new ideas, uh, both in uh, uh, socio-political terms as well as in, uh, you see, art form. All these new poets, including uh, uh, Pound, Eliot, uh, E. Cumming, uh, uh, Ivor Winter, so on and so forth, all of these uh, poets were promoted by, you see, Harriet Munro. But for her, many of these writers would not have been known even. So uh, she did a great job in promoting uh, literature, both uh, poetry and fiction in uh, America. Another promoter uh, was Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein wrote that famous book, The Making of Americans. And she lived in Paris most of the time, uh, where all of these people used to go, including um, uh, you see, Ezra Pound, uh, T.S. Eliot, Hemingway lived there with her for quite some time. In fact, she used to take credit saying uh, that Hemingway learned to write English by proofreading <laughs> my book, The Making of Americans. Hemingway, of course, retorted in anger uh, because later he became more famous. Uh, but then it is a fact that in our uh, 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 in our, uh, you see, enthusiasm for promoting new writers. She did help Hemingway, and Hemingway does acknowledge it uh, at places. It was only later that they fell out. Uh, that's a different story. But then Gertrude Stein, again, like Harriet Munro, uh, had a great role to play, and she acted as a senior uh, writer, advising all these new writers uh, 
uh, how to write better prose and how to learn from the continental artists. Uh, in the modernist period of the 1920s, it was for the first time uh, two things were happening. One, coming together of different arts. You see, uh, poetry, painting, music, all these arts came together and they were collaborating. They were trying to evolve a common poetics for all the arts, uh, even architecture. Uh, the, the word modernism and then postmodernism uh, came from architecture. So uh, uh, this was one important thing that happened during 1920s, the modernist period. Other was uh, coming together of the continental writers. Earlier, uh, the British writers and then far away the American writers, uh, they were writing in isolation. For the first time now, not only the British writers mixed up with the French and the German and the Italian, all living in Paris, uh, but even the Americans joined them, Ezra Pound, Eliot, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, all of these writers, uh, they came to Paris. So Paris was a home for the artists in the 1920s and uh, a great seat for the artists to uh, promote uh, all over, uh, not only Europe, uh, America included these two continents. Uh, arts mm, got a big promotion. Now, uh, here talking of women writers in the uh, 1920s, uh, one name that comes to mind is uh, Amy Lowell, A-M-Y. Amy Lowell. You see, she uh, headed the Imagist movement. In fact, modernism, so called, was not a movement per se. Uh, it was uh, a collection of or collaboration of several minor movements like symbolism, Imagism, Dada Dadaism. Cubism, so on and so forth. There were so many art for art's sake. So all these movements combined and came to be known as uh, modernism. Uh, so Amy Lowell uh, was heading the Imagist movement and she also edited a journal on Imagism. So Imagist poetry she was publishing. So their focus was that rather than uh, make idea uh, as uh, the focus of a poem, it should be the image. You convey your ideas and emotions through images, through comparisons, metaphors, similes, symbols, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, see, illusion. Uh, so that was our emphasis. And Pound, of course, uh, was one of the partners and uh, he helped in editing the journal. He collected uh, his Imagist poetry. Later, as it generally happens, they also fell out. And he said, uh, it is not Imagism, this is Emyism, her name. So, uh, Pound, you know, known for biting uh, remarks. Uh, anyway, but then she stood on her own and uh, she made important contribution. Then he himself started a separate movement called Vorticism, uh, different from Imagism. Practically it is not really different. But then he says, no, no, he would use high sounding words, vortex, borrowing from science and yes. engineering and showing that, you say, uh, that in poetry also, uh, every poem has a vortex and all images hang around that vortex and so on, like an excess. Uh, so that went on. But a lot of writers, as I said, came up during the 20th century, a lot of women writers. Uh, in the 19th, there were not so many. 
So uh, there was a cultural revolution, political revolution. And if you remember uh, the voting right for women, uh, 1922, uh, for the first time. And it didn't come uh, uh, for asking. They had to struggle for it, both in England as well as America. And they went to jails. They came out in the streets. So uh, struggle. So it was a struggle all around in politics and uh, you see social life changing uh, the Puritan hold, uh, defying the Puritan hold. And uh, they were successful. And a new America was emerging. That's why it is called Second Renaissance. The first Renaissance was uh, triggered by the American independence, 1772. So it resulted into the first Renaissance. Second Renaissance came because of uh, the margins rising now against the center. The blacks are rising. Uh, uh, 1865 abolished slavery. And then women rising, uh, particularly in the 1920s. So a new America was born uh, after 1920s. And uh, you have new literature. That's why when Mike Brooks rightly says, uh, America is coming of age, now it has come of age. And it was for the first time in 1915 uh, uh, that America participated in an outside war, the European war, World War I. Uh, mm, and emerged as a world power. After the Second World War, of course, uh, it assumed dominance of world politics. But in 1920s, it had assumed a leadership in literature uh, in Europe also, because Pound and Elliot, they were heading the modernist movement. And uh, they had their following in England and uh, Paris and other parts of Europe also. So America now emerging as a world power and a new America, a continental America, looking outward now, not looking inward. Until the end of the 19th century, before World War I, it was just there. Anyway, uh, quickly, um, after World War II, I must mention one name, and that is black American writer, uh, you know, Tony, Tony Morrison, Morrison, very important. So Tony Morrison is a major uh, uh, woman novelist, and a black also. So that is uh, her distinction. And she is uh, an out and out uh, a feminist, and uh, very vocal, very outspoken. And in her novel, she raises the issue of uh, the woman repression. And she says the black women are doubly repressed. Uh, first, they are repressed as blacks. And second, they are repressed as women. So they have to carry the uh, burden of double repression and survive there. And therefore, they will have to muster much more courage than the white woman to 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 get the fruits of equality now in new America. And hence the movement. She, she became uh, quite a leader there. So I think we stop there. We have talked enough. Definitely, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have talked, we have covered a number of writers, but uh, sir, uh, you were mentioning uh, at the beginning that you would also like to talk about uh, Hilda Doolittle. So if uh, we could uh, say request you to say a bit about her as well. Uh, HD, as you told <coughs> us. Uh, yeah, <coughs> sure. HD, form. Uh, very fascinating uh, see, abbreviation. Uh, I don't <coughs> think any <coughs> other poet had this kind of abbreviation. But um, she had. She was one of this group of imagist uh, poets headed by Amy Lowell. And uh, she regularly contributed to that magazine, Imagist Poetry. And uh, uh, very much uh, writing in the same style. 
Uh, but unfortunately, these uh, you see um, uh, historians like Robert Spiller, even about the best of them, Emily Dickinson, uh, whatever uh, you see paragraphs he has devoted, is devoted to her private life that perhaps she was in love with somebody who is not mentioned, and all her poetry may be about. It's all nonsense. You see, they will go after such scandal or juicy uh, matter and leave aside poetry. Why don't you talk about her poetry? If you think she was a great poet, talk about her uh, you see, poems. But uh, I was disappointed. Not even a single poem is mentioned, mentioned. anywhere. Uh, although I have been teaching Emily Dickinson, she has excellent poems and so many. And uh, unfortunately, our poetry was published after our death uh, in 1890, uh, not during our lifetime. And she came to be known better in the 1920s. Uh, these, uh, you see, new poets like Pound and Eliot, uh, they brought her into prominence, that here is a writer who deserves attention. And she's as good as uh, John Donne is. So why is she being ignored? So she came to light only in the 1920s. Before that, uh, even the Americans had not cared to read her. Anyway, so and uh, Hilda Doolittle was a part of the Imagist movement and wrote short poems. That was uh, one emphasis of Imagist poetry to write short poems, not to write long ones like T.S. Eliot, and uh, focus on the image. Make an image the center of the poem. Obviously, if it is focused on one image, it has to be a short poem. So very short poems. And uh, Pound, of course, is known for having written a one-line poem. Uh, another was two line poems. So, because he used to offer models to the new poets. So, that was Imagist poetry, and HD was very much a part of that. Right. <clears throat> Sir, you also mentioned that uh, a lot of writers then had come, uh, say, into Paris, and uh, you mentioned uh, Pound, and then there was Gertrude Stein, and mm. And then uh, it was a coming together of different arts as well, poetry, music, painting in the 1920s. And uh, for the first time, British writers and writers uh, from America and uh, uh, say uh, people who were writing in French, they came together and they were writing together. And it was not just, just uh, poetry as British, American, but uh, probably a coming together, a confluence of uh, the very different ones. So, sir, did the Gertrude Steen also contribute in a very instrumental way in this uh, yeah, of development? Yeah, She was a major force uh, in Paris. And whoever wanted to be a writer, obviously, uh, she was sought for uh, contact. And um, she was the one who actually internationalized uh, arts uh, in the West. And uh, that is why you find in Hemingway uh, international situations. Uh, uh, very few uh, writings, including his short stories, are located in America. Uh, novels are mostly located in Europe. Of course, uh, America's participation in World War I also was a signal for the internationalization of the globe. Now, global politics, global economics, and global arts also. So, arts also became internationalized after World War I. So, that was a breakthrough. Now, the world was coming together. And it was coming together because of the development of te uh, technology. You had the airplane now. Right. Earlier, you didn't have that. So, for the first time in World War I, you had the airplanes participating. Definitely. So, sir, it's very uh, say peculiar also to note that we have discussed a number of women writers who contributed uh, significantly and in a larger way to talk about social issues, political issues, uh, 
talk about uh, women's issues, but they have been largely ignored and not, not part of the whole anthology or part of the whole uh, collection of uh, American history and uh, literature in that sense. And uh, we also uh, looked at how uh, Villa Kathar, as uh, you mentioned, one of the writers uh, who talks about how women were repressed by both religion and politics. Yes. And they rightly uh, deserve a place. And yeah, a lost lady yes, is sir, the best example. Yes, sir. I read this novel time and again. And uh, she focuses on the woman character, central character, how she feels uh, hounded by the old milieu, social milieu, which is uh, uh, repressive and how it tells upon her psyche. So that uh, psychological state of mind, and by the way, it was with her and Henry James that uh, uh, the psychological novel emerged in America. You remember, Henry James is credited, not these women writers, Definitely. which is unfortunate. Yes. They, they equally contributed to right. the emergence of the psychological novel. In fact, uh, they focused more on internal life because of the uh, condition of the female yes, uh, in America. Right. Sir, as uh, these women uh, were also definitely aware of the situation where they are not being given due credit and the other writers like Pound or Elliot are being more glorified than them. So was this uh, feeling of being neglected uh, of, uh, surfacing in their writings as well? Yeah, of course. It was. That they are not part of the canonical uh, literature. Uh, yeah, and uh, they realize that their fight is not yet over. They have to continue it, and they did right up to World War II. And it is only after World War II that they started getting some space. Uh, new histories now are coming, and uh, exclusive on women writing also and exclusive on black writing too. Earlier, uh, these compendium histories, uh, uh, say just uh, one inclusive, they ignored both. And uh, uh, that's why, but then individual, uh, you see writers also matter, like Gertrude Stein was a domineering personality. Right. So she wouldn't bother about Pound or Elliot or anyone. Right. So uh, it is they who would bother about, <laughs> about her. her. Yes. So personality yes. sometimes uh, say uh, overpowers all limitations. Right. So you also mentioned that in fact she was the one who promoted new writers. Yes. Gertrude Stein. Yeah, I remember I worked on Hemingway for my PhD, and whatever Hemingway might say. Uh, making of Hemingway was uh, 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 a matter of her contribution uh, a great deal because he was a runaway from school. <laughs> he didn't go even to college and took up uh, journalism and uh, then uh, took to writing. So obviously he was not um, very proficient uh, at uh, writing English and fiction and so on. But then uh, she certainly helped it. Uh, even Pound helped. He used to joke, he said, Pound tell, told me how not to use uh, uh, adjectives, epithets. And I, uh, she taught him how to box. <laughs> so because he was fond of boxing. And Pound wanted to learn boxing. So he will knock him down he said, he taught me uh, uh, the use of epithets, and I taught him boxing. <laughs> so he learned a good deal from these writers, particularly Gertrude Stein, no doubt. Right. And uh, so you mentioned uh, two writers, Edith Wharton and Villa Cather, and also that they are pre-modernist writers. And the writing, even though they continue to write after the war, the writing was more of the period before the war, so it was more optimistic and more positive as opposed to what the lost generation writers were coming up with. So it was more uh, positive and perhaps they saw more... Yes. Uh, yeah, the sense of discontinuity which war uh, brought uh, 
is missing there in the pre-modern uh, writers. Right. Because in pre-modern writing, there is a continuity of culture and social order, even political order, which gets a shaking in World War I, uh, culturally, socially, politically, America too was shaken. And then uh, a new, you say, mindset comes up. Uh, well, it came to be known as lost generation. Lost because uh, they had lost contact with the past. They were in revolt against the past, Puritan past. But new path was yet to be found. So they were hanging in between. Where to go now? You have kicked off uh, your past. But you, you don't know where to go uh, ahead. So that is why they were called lost generation. And if you remember in Hemingway, uh, the hero is always trying to let's say, get, get on to his feet. Uh, Jake Barnes in The Sun also rises. You see, uh, there are other characters who get lost all the time, drinking, sexing, uh, wandering around aimlessly. Yes. He is trying to give uh, a structure to his life, going to the office on time, uh, doing his work every day, and then uh, trying to evolve secular values. Puritanism is gone, but you can't live without values. So he, you see, evolves the value of love, value of friendship, value of solidarity with other people, so on and so forth. So that was uh, the difference between the modernists and the pre-modernists. Uh, Edith Wharton and Willa Cather are not shaken that way. They Not don't true. feel disconnected with uh, uh, the American society as true. these people did. Yeah. True. Right, sir. And uh, sir, actually that made for a very interesting discussion that we've had about all these uh, women writers. And uh, in that regard, sir, I would like to ask you any book where one could actually go and read a good deal on these writers. Uh, where not just not going to the history of American literature, but perhaps any other source where one could read about how wonderfully they've contributed to the history of American literature and also world literature. Uh, yeah, there are now, you see, uh, separate books on women writing. You will have to look up your uh, internet. I may not remember offhand. But uh, there are several now, uh, separate on uh, uh, women writing because there is a movement now, a feminist movement. Of course, later it got split into white and black, and then uh, American and European, and then Asian, Indian, so on and so forth. True, sir. That is uh, unfortunate about human efforts, that ultimately it uh, splits and becomes, you say, uh, or gets lost finally, because once you lose solidarity, once you lose a uh, force of unity, then obviously it gets lost. The same thing is happening with feminism. It started with a great enthusiasm, but because of the split, because of their own theory, theory has done a lot of damage, capital T because that, as I always say, is divisive, is reductive, is nihilistic. It has, you see, divided everything in unlimited ways. Even culture, if, if you say culture is, uh, you see, location specific or community specific, then there is no end to it. As I always say, India has more than 3,000 communities. So do you think we have as many cultures, as many literatures then, as many uh, women uh, movements then? So if you split, you see, every movement, every literature, every culture into unlimited, you see, boxes, obviously you are doing disservice to the movement. True, You are not serving it. And there is a clever move. Um, you see, one of these uh, theorists of theory, uh, 
um, uh, Paul D. Mann and others. Uh, later it was discovered that they were on the payroll of CIA. So that always happened. And uh, why this um, uh, now new emphasis of theory on ethnicity, race, so on and so forth, why? Yes. America or the West, you see America and Europe put together, uh, they have uh, one religion, one community. Uh, they would uh, like to believe they are Christians and uh, they are Westerns, they are white, they have one, you say, NATO army and therefore united. Whereas Asia, Africa, unlimited tribes and communities and so on. So give them a literary theory so that they are busy with this. You see, I always question it, it is nonsense. Why, why can't you have your own thinking? Definitely why must you go by what Derrida says or Foucault says? So the, the, they are not, say, godheads. They are humans like us. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Sir, uh, with that, uh, we've had a very wonderful discussion and we've all looked at the women writers of America, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, part of our series on American literature. And we've also seen how these uh, wonderfully creative writers are not present in official histories of American literature. And Sir has discussed that with us. So uh, with this, I'd like to thank all the viewers for watching and let us thank our subject expert for being here. Thank you so much, sir. And thank, thank you. you.